Well, my name's Graham Phillip and I work predominantly in the Middle East. I've been working there probably for 30 odd years now. Um, I started, as, as most Middle Eastern archaeologists do, being primarily interested in excavations and artefacts, things like pottery, uh, metal artefacts, which is what I, I did for my own PhD. And I, I worked, I've worked in sites in Jordan, Syria, Eastern Turkey, Cyprus, Nile Delta, a whole variety of places. So I think I've developed a sense of the Middle East as a, as a region, as a holistic landscape, rather than one particular sub-region. I started doing uh, conventional excavation archaeological fieldwork and I was particularly interested in the origins of complex societies, how large sites come into being. But it became apparent after a number of seasons of fieldwork that we were really only seeing a small part of a much larger picture and I was aware that many sites were being excavated but what we were getting was individual sequences that tell you quite a lot about that individual site but it didn't tell you very much about the wider context within which these sites developed and you might characterize it as as being a number of points of light floating in a large dark sea and we have no ideas for example if some of the points of light are parts of convoys if other points of light are deliberately avoiding each other we didn't really understand the connections between them and in a way this is how I, how I got involved in landscape archaeology and the idea of landscape archaeology is to understand the total the totality of human activity across a landscape. This can include sites, including both big sites and small sites, includes things like agricultural installations, threshing floors, olive oil, oil presses, wine presses, um, even things like infrastructure like quarries and the likes, road systems. And traditionally, this was fairly, landscape research was fairly undeveloped in the Middle East. Back in the 1990s, when we started this kind of work, even getting hold of uh, high-resolution maps was quite difficult. But round about that time, satellite imagery started to become available, and we looked into the possibilities that imagery would offer. And it became apparent, initially we looked at the Landsat data, which is widely used by uh, geologists, agriculture people for, for mapping crops and soil distributions. And we realised that we could spot a lot of the known sites on the imagery. And the underlying property appears to be something to do with the way that archaeological soils reflect light, because they do that in a way that is different from what you might call natural geological soils. So soils that are influenced by the presence of humans reflect light rather differently. We still don't know exactly why this is the case, but it's probably something to do with um, crushed up building materials, for example decayed mud brick, uh, household refuse, probably things like ash, wood ash, animal dung ash, and perhaps even waste products from animals and human beings. The problem with the imagery that was initially available was that it its resolution was limited to 30 meter blocks. Think of it, a 30 meter square was just assigned one particular value. But in the late 1990s, the US government declassified what was called the Corona program. Corona had been a set of uh, spy satellites that flew from the early 1960s through to the early 1970s. And a Corona gives a resolution not of 30 meters, but of six feet which is closer to two meters, and it allows you to identify individual buildings, practically individual vehicles on roads. It gives you a much higher resolution image. And again, we discovered, rather to our surprise, that we could identify sites very clearly on Corona. And because the Corona imagery was taken mostly in the 60s and early 70s, in many parts of the Middle East, it predates major urban expansions and uh, agricultural change, intensive modern intensive agriculture, uh, modern irrigation schemes and so on, and it preserves an archaeological landscape, parts of which are quite hard to find today. Now what we have been doing is using the corona data to identify areas that have a that look like they might be sites and then simply going out on the ground to check them out and we found more than 90 percent of the potential sites from our corona imagery in the, where we worked in the Homs area of Syria um, were successful. About 10% of it is, was due to 
short-term construction activity, other activities in the landscape, sometimes things of which no trace remains now when you go out in the landscape 40 years after those images were taken. But it's been an invaluable tool. Now, traditionally, the way archaeologists had to do survey was by walking, by collecting quite intensively sample areas. You either have to collect very small areas, 100%, or you have to sample, which means you collect sample areas intensively and you just have to extrapolate from those sample areas as to what lies in between in the areas that you haven't been able to investigate. Of course Corona gets you around a lot of these problems because you can look at a whole landscape simply on a computer screen, mark all the areas or the potential sites and then go out and check them out. Check them out. And the difference this has made to Middle Eastern archaeology is simply, it is simply astronomical. It's given us a tool for reconstructing a large part of the ancient settlement landscape, at least in those areas for which it works. It's not so effective in mountainous zones, for example. It's not effective in zones where there's very heavy alluviation. But in large tracts of the Middle East, Corona does give you a very good way of identifying not just settlements, but structures in the landscape, stone circles, burial cairns, all kinds of things. It seemed sensible to apply this to much larger scale questions. So we had an AHRC grant for a project known as the Fragile Crescent, which sought to pull together data from 10 or 12 different survey areas. Um, a mixture, um, it, it was a mixture of data that had been collected in the field, some recently, some as long ago as 25 years ago. And then we used the satellite imagery to go back and revisit the landscape and identify additional sites, identify sites that appear to be a different size from the, what the original ground survey had used and there were also some much more uh, some current work one or two new areas were brought into the project so the project was particularly focused on understanding the origins of the first big urban civilizations and most of this takes place between about 4000 BC and 2000 BC and what's become apparent because we have this large-scale settlement record we've been able to use dated sites where we have them but we've also, because we have a large repertoire of dated sites, we've also been able to identify particular site forms and morphologies, shapes, if you will, that appear by and large to fall within particular periods. So we've been able to, as it were, guesstimate where some unsurveyed sites might fall uh, time-wise. And what's emerged from that project is that the, the transition towards urbanism is quite differentiated across the, the dry farming belt of the Near East. This is a region that extends from northern Iraq across southeastern Turkey, uh, northern and western Syria down to the, basically the Lebanese border. For example, in parts of northern Iraq and northern Syria, we see some very big sites appearing shortly after 4000 BC. However, in other areas, we see big sites appearing closer to 2500 BC, but the ones that appear at 2500 BC have very, uh, have very particular plans. They usually have ramparts around them. They often have a central acropolis. So there seem to be at least two broad phases of, uh, of urbanism. I think the next step, given that we've got multi-period data, we've really only analysed the 4th and 3rd millennium BC data, would be to look at the later periods and extend, try and follow the long-running cycles of complexity and collapse right through into the Middle Ages, perhaps even almost down to modern times. For example, one thing that has become clear is if you read historical accounts about the ancient Middle East, the Late Bronze Age is often described as the period of internationalism, lots of international trade and connections. In actual fact, in settlement terms, the Late Bronze Age is substantially downhill. It's a much emptier, reduced landscape compared to the 3rd millennium BC, which is quite interesting. But of course, the historical records derive from the written sources and the people writing in the late Bronze Age had no idea what the settlement landscape of a thousand years looked like. So they didn't have that sense. This is something that we, with the deep time perspective of archaeology, can see. Another obvious way to take it forward is to build on the major advances that have been made in recent years in understanding past climates and past environmental change. And we're considering entering into one or two international collaborations with colleagues in the US and in Europe 
to link together our long-term settlement data and <clears throat> other institutions' data on paleoclimate and environments and think about population levels, the impacts populations would have on particular landscapes, also the long-term ups and downs of climate. The, the, the actuality will be a, a combination of long-term climate cycles plus the much more short-term fluctuations and pressures that people live with and experience. We've already had a number of PhD students working on settlement data and I had one recent, one of my current students spent several months in Tübingen working with um, Simon Riel and other specialists on paleoenvironmental data. She's seeking to integrate uh, routeways, settlement patterns and environmental change over several thousand years. The other thing I suppose is to bring back in the material culture element because we've been working on settlement data, image data, modelling site sizes and so on. But materials, particularly things like pottery, offer you a very good way of understanding the interaction between sites. Simply looking at what's made locally, what is made perhaps in a single centre but distributed very widely, what are being shipped around as containers. So an obvious way forward is to, in, is to move into much more detailed pottery studies of the material from different sites. That's the kind of project students can be involved in for a dissertation. It, it's not difficult to deal with a group of pottery from one particular site, one particular period. And as you build it all up, you get the big picture. Another area we've been exploring is the landscapes of the dead. We've been talking here about settlements, but in parallel with this, we have another project called the Invisible Dead, which has been looking at the number of dead, where we find them. And one thing that has become very apparent is the ups and downs in the settlement record and the ups and downs in the burial record do not coincide. You don't get more dead during periods of high population. So clearly the death, the burial and disposal of the dead is being driven by a completely different process. And again, there are a whole host of areas here where quite detailed specialist studies of individual sites, individual artefact types are essential to feed back into our understanding of the large scale pattern.